Hello, everybody, and welcome to Right to Democracy Television, another episode live at 525 on the fourth Friday of every month. Uh, we're happy to bring it to you again in cooperation with Channel 17, local Channel 17 in Chittenden County, uh, CCTV, Center for Media Democracy and Town Meeting Television. Um, uh, Rights and Democracy is a bi-state, grassroots, people-powered organization committed to bringing um, independent political change. Um, we're here this month with uh, RAD members Dustin Tanner uh, down on the far end of the table and Adrian Pasquale. Yep. All right. Well, it's good to see you guys. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so just to bring everybody up to speed. What we'll be talking about this month is uh, we're going to respond to uh, recent hate crimes in uh, Claremont, New Hampshire, and the Northeast Kingdom, West Glover to be specific. Um, then we're going to uh, talk about teachers' unions and their right to strike in relation to recent events in, uh, in Burlington and about a year ago in South Burlington. Um, and how that relates to worker protections and our uh, Raise Up Vermont campaign. Um, then we'll talk about some development projects in Burlington and their, uh, their ability to change the face of Burlington and uh, really change how people view the city and uh, when they show up and, and how we live here. Um, Rights and Democracy has been working to design a fair development assessment tool um, for a more de democratic communal decision-making process around development projects. Um, and then finally, we're going to review a bit about RAD's overall modus operandi uh, movement politics, which is really how we're going to focus on bringing change to communities. Um, so let's just take a quick start by um, talking about Claremont, New Hampshire. Um, a couple weeks ago, an eight-year-old biracial boy in Claremont, New Hampshire, was harassed by a group of white teenagers and then actually hung from a tree. An eight-year-old boy. Uh, thankfully, the little boy survived, um, but the response from the Claremont Police Department has been not very satisfactory, focusing on pr uh, protecting the, the teenage perpetrators and not really standing up for the victim. Um, so something helpful that you can do is call the police department in Claremont and let them know uh, what you feel about that type of uh, way of handling this uh, juvenile issue, which is not really juvenile at all. It's, a, it's a, an enormous issue. Of, spreads across all ages um, and we really need to you know obviously talk about this stuff a lot a lot harsher when we and get this into kids heads that this stuff it really isn't okay um, so you can talk to them uh, you can also public publicize everything you can about this event on your social media account and national news sources if you can get it up there all the better um, the more news we can get spread around this the better um, and then just recently even more recently than that um, in West Glover, Vermont, at the Andersonville farm, um, employees found a swastika and some other racist graffiti spray painted on the barn. Um, the Jasper Hill officials posted a message on their Facebook page announcing a $1,000 reward leading to the arrest of the person responsible. Um, so personally, I just I think that this is a more divisive kind of behavior that I, th I think is creating issues with our political movements. Um, and I just uh, I think it's probably something that we can use as a learnable moment for both of our small states. Um, and so I'd like to just ask the guests, are you guys, anybody like to say anything about this stuff? I wouldn't, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a line of kids being stupid when you're young. And I think we can all say that we've done our fair share of dumb things as a young teenager or a young kid. Um, even mean. Like, even mean. Yeah. I had to go to tolerance camp when I was in seventh grade because of things that I said, because I saw them said on a TV show, and I said them to a student, and that was not correct to say. Um, but there is a line that, no matter what age you are, you shouldn't cross. And... You know, I was thinking about the Claremont, New Hampshire incident, and I was looking into it, and the more I looked into it, the more I got disgusted, because there's no response. There's not been a satisfactory response. You know, it's different if, you know, a kid threw a rock at a truck or something, or if a kid, you know, said something stupid, or went to school and said something dumb in front of a teacher like that, because you give them the education, you give them the training on why these things are bad. But the fact that they actually put a rope around the kid's neck is just... It's sickening. 
it's sickening that these kids thought I I'm more I am more sick over where did they get the idea that this was a good idea from. Because what does that say about the influences in the house and the influences that they've been seeing in the media and in school? Because nobody just gets this idea to do something like that out of the blue. Nobody's just like, hey, guess what we're going to do today? There are obviously, you know, racial sources feeding into this to give those kids the idea of thinking, you know, that's okay or that's a good idea. And it's not. And Even if you learn about um, lynchings from our past as a country, to get the idea to go do this... And actually carry it out. Yeah, like, I mean, this is it's, what, it's mind blowing. You know, that's where I go from like, okay, it's kids being stupid to like, these are kids who did something wrong. And, you know, if this young man who got lynched would have died, I think we're talking a totally different story right now, too. I think we're talking kids who are facing charges as adults. And, um, mm. and I think if, if it's in a different community, you know, Claremont, New Hampshire is not. You know, New England, New Hampshire, and Vermont are very not—you know—are not the nicest place to live if you're a minority because you're outnumbered and there's a lot of ignorance in our communities up here. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people. There are a lot of white people who are very ignorant on the racial issues, and it just makes me sick to think about. And I really wish Claire Mott would have handled it handled it better. Um, and I really wish us as a society can teach these things better and mm. educate on why racism is wrong. And um, I could go into that a little more, but I want to let Adrian have the floor for a little bit here to give his thoughts as well. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so I think particularly when you look at the case in West Glover, um, I know that I've read a lot of news stories about Jewish cemeteries being desecrated and tombstones being broken and things like that, especially in the Philadelphia region. And I think that seeing this instance of swastikas and anti-Semitic graffiti being drawn in somewhere that's so close um, to Burlington and, and somewhere that, you know, where we probably have friends or have been to that neighborhood, I think is, is kind of scary and intimidating. Um, and the question really becomes, is this part of a larger trend that we see that is correlated with the current administration um, and the tensions that people are um, are feeling now after the events that happened in Virginia and things like that. So um, I'm just really hoping that this is an indicative of a greater trend and that we as a community stay as vigilant as we can be when it comes to incidences of, of hate and discrimination and um, intolerance. So I, th I think it's I think it's you know you're seeing this in other places in the country, but the hope is is that as long as we're, we're aware of these things and that we report on them and that we draw attention to these issues and condemn them in every way that we can, mm -hmm. that it's something that we can help mitigate in the future. Mm -hmm. Let's keep talking about them when we see them, say it, say something, See something, say other. something yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Like, you know, that was a very yeah. ill-advised campaign in the early 2000s, this corrupt, you know, the fight against terrorism and say something, see something. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. when it comes to things like, you know, racism and, anti-Semitism, I think you should, if you see something, you say something. Um, we actually had another example that came out today in Georgia. Mm. A substitute teacher led kids in the Nazi salute. Um, huh. And this is in the seven days off message as of today. Um, yeah. And uh, the district had a great response. They fired her immediately. They immediately fired the teacher that led this and had huh. brought in counselors to educate the children on this. And um, you know, it's, it's more widespread than you think. And I think a lot of people, because of the current administration, are willing to come out and have these terrible thoughts and say, well, I can have these terrible thoughts now because mm. why not? Who's going to punish me? And it's, wow. it's bad. It's bad. Okay. Um, so just, uh, let's see, the end of last week and the beginning of this week, um, Burlington city teachers went on a citywide strike. Um, the students were still able to participate in extracurricular activities such as the varsity sports and um, even some of the uh, recreation programs. Um, but uh, this brought up a lot of issues around uh, the, the, the workers' rights, uh, the rights of the community who hires the teachers, expects them to be teaching the kids, uh, whether or not it should be legal for teachers to strike, uh, who it's hurting, what's the message getting across. And um, I just wanted to take a second and really talk about that. Um, Dustin, you uh, work in a school system? Yes, I work at a school system that doesn't have a contract. I um, 
work at Milton Elementary School. I'm in the I'm a district employee of Milton Town School Districts, um, which have also been in the news for quite a few things ourselves. Um, but you know, striking is the teacher's really only option when the negotiations break down. And there are a lot of teachers that are not being compensated well. And this Burlington strike wasn't even really about the compensation. It was about the work environment. And I think that's something that is not really being discussed amongst our school boards and our schools right now. School work environments have taken a trend downhill statewide, I would say, for the last several years now. And... You know, I saw a article by a local newspaper or a local news station talking about how the teachers, you know, it painted the teachers as greedy, as greedy, greedy, greedy. And that's not the case. <laughs> like, first off, there is not a teacher who's like, I'm going to go get a college degree because I want to make six figures. There is not a single teacher who is in it for the money. Because if you know anything about teaching in the state of Vermont and teaching in general, it is not a cash cow. Um, these teachers are not driving around Lamborghinis. Some of the administrators might be, and that's a problem we should talk about towards the future. Um, but, you know, these teachers are coming, and they're educating kids every day, classes of 30 to 40, and they're teaching these young adults, these students, how to be members of society. And to think that they are not worth the ability to have good working conditions is it's, you know, it's insane. It's sickening. It's something that I look at, you know, I obviously supported the Burlington teachers because, you know, how are you going to get good working conditions? You know, like, what are you going to do? Just keep working under bad working conditions and hoping the hand that is feeding you these bad working conditions will say, well, I guess we'll make it better. That's not how change happens. You know, you don't get changed by going along with it. And I think the strike is going to be one of the big events that helps turn Burlington schools around. Um, I have a lot of friends down here who have sent kids to Burlington schools, who have worked at the Burlington schools, and they've talked about how it's just gotten worse. It's just gotten worse. And mm. teachers aren't getting enough prep time. Teachers aren't There's getting- There's been a lot of them. teachers uh, leaving the, the Burlington It's a turnstile, like over, at this point. Over the past you know, years. you go, I read one article, it was like, the only people teaching at Burlington High School are lifers and new teachers because new teachers need jobs and they come in, get a couple good years on their resume, leave for the better job, leave for the better working conditions and, you know, pretty much a farm team in Chittenden County for teachers and that takes away, especially when your biggest, your biggest school in the state of Vermont, you know, I know South Burlington, CVU, Essex, they might have more numbers like, the numbers between the four of them, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. But you would think you would want the best teachers in the state at a school like Burlington. You'd think you'd want to keep them there because you are the biggest city in the state with the biggest budget in the state as far the as The most diverse go. population. You would think it'd be important to listen to your teachers and say, well, actually, we do need to give them these abilities to work better on curriculums and give them more prep time because they have to prepare for more because, you know, a teacher, a Burlington teacher could walk into a classroom and have 10 different kids speak 10 different languages. Right. And that's not something you will get in other parts of this state. And it takes a very special teacher to A, have the patience and B, have the know, you know, have the knowledge to be able to teach such a diverse classroom. You know, being an educator is five days a week rolling with whatever punches are thrown your way and saying, well, I'm going to make the best of today. And I'm really glad they were able to strike a deal. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where it's about messaging, too. So, because so we didn't want to paint the teachers as, um, as wrong or greedy or evil. No. Or what about the school board? They, they greedy and evil? I mean, they were trying to impose oh. a contract, yeah. which everybody thinks is kind of a terrible thing, but they kind of had a... a what do you think, Adrian? Yeah, definitely. So um, I actually serve on the steering committee for Wards 2 and 3 Neighborhood Planning Assembly. And at our most recent event, we had um, a representative from the school board, Liz Curry, come and discuss this very issue of what the school board is going through th during some of these negotiations. Obviously, there were things that couldn't be discussed, but um, I think the fact that it's, I think it's very important for everyone to remember that people who work for the school board or, or who are on the school board are working in a volunteer capacity. Thankless position yeah, as well. Yeah, it's and a very thankless position. And um, on top of the fact that their budgets have been cut tremendously in the past five or six years, 
Um, and I, I remember Ms. Curry mentioned something like over $5 million have been cut from the school budget, which makes it really hard to guarantee teachers three, four, or five percent increases in their salaries, yeah. raises. Um, hmm. And I know that a big concern of theirs is also property taxes. I yeah. mean, we really don't mm -hmm. want um, to raise property taxes substantially in Burlington because then it inhibits new people from coming into town and deciding that they want to live here or investing in real estate in Burlington. Um, and it, I think that raising property taxes to fund our school board, which is something that we've been doing recently, Burlington now has the highest property taxes in the state um, around the, um, near the surrounding school districts. I mean, I think we're pushing people out of our district in that way if we say, well, only people who can afford to live here can live here, and that's the only way that we can fund our school system. And I'm glad you mentioned this because what we saw at Burlington is not going to be special to Burlington. It's going to happen statewide. Um, the mechanism we use to fund our schools is woefully outdated and it targets the middle class. Um, using property taxes to fund our schools is the biggest slap in the face of middle class people who want to educate their kids because the fact of the matter is that you know you have we need a little bit of school consolidation which we're seeing but we need to change the way we fund our school system because it's not fair that you know none of us at this table are paying for our schools we are all three working people who have jobs and have incomes that you know we can expend and you know the you know your grandmother you know your 70 year old grandmother on social security is paying for our schools and it's because she bought a house and that is not fair to anybody in vermont because one a lot of us can just turn a blind eye to what we're seeing in our schools and two it really creates this perception that every time a school needs more funding well it's greedy and they're going on the backs of taxpayers but mm. you know only one third of vermont is really paying for our schools and the fact of the matter mm. is is that our schools really affect our whole community. And going off something Adrian said, um, being on the school board, there is no such thing as a bad or a good side because the school boards have one of the roughest jobs in the state of Vermont, especially because Governor Phil Scott, governor for the working people, Scott, decided to go at, after a lot of school budgets and contracts have been negotiated, say, you need to find $30 million to cut, which is, if I'm on a school board, what am I supposed to do? I've tried to negotiate in good faith with my school, you know, with my teachers teaching union and you know, I've already had to make some concessions because property tax revenue is down and it's not the best way to fund things, but you have to deal with the hands. And now you're saying I have to find 30 million more. It backs the school board in a corner where no matter what the school board does, they are the bad guy. Mm. Um, and it backs teachers in the corner because teachers are not going to, I'm not going to willingly take, with millions off my health care. This, this, this big charge was um, due to health care funding, right? And which is another rights and democracy campaign that we're working on, save health care, create health care for all. That would be a, a big deal. But um, so if we're working on that front, then we're facing less of a, an issue when we're looking at our school boards and, and, and our strikes and our, and our need for our um, uh, workers at the school level, the teacher level, to strike on their own behalf to get the health care, you know, or something right, like right. that. Um, alleviate one more of those stressors. Um, uh, so we probably got about 15 minutes left, about halfway through, maybe 10. Um, so I wanted to get into talking about fair development. Um, the fair development assessment tool is something that rights and democracy um, Let's see, we modeled it off of a tool that I think we found used in Baltimore. And uh, we introduced it about a year ago, and we had a, a good panel discuss some of the issues around Burlington Town Center, uh, the redevelopment of our largest uh, kind of property in Burlington, um, it, which is going to become the uh, tallest uh, building in the state of Vermont with the new zoning um, changes that they allowed to go through for that project. Uh, there's another development project called Cambrian Rise, um, and that's taking up some very valuable open space in Burlington, and it's going to um, build on it some condos and some pretty exclusive properties that um, only a few people will be able to spend a bunch of money on and see the, uh, see the sunset at night, see the lake views, and. Um, that didn't seem right to a large part 
a large portion of the uh, populace of Burlington. So we're trying to um, bring these issues to light a, a lot sooner so that maybe people can get a little more involved in the planning process. In Burlington, we do have neighborhood planning associations, as Adrian just mentioned. Um, and this is where people are supposed to get out and voice their concerns for development projects. Uh, but still, even at those meetings, and if you can't get to them for whatever reason, um, we're still working to create a, a way that um, people can be a little bit more connected democratically to the decision making that goes on in their towns. Um, specifically right now, uh, what we're looking at is uh, Memorial Auditorium, which is kind of a gateway open to the city, opening to the city, a welcome to the city and uh, City Hall Park, which is a, just like a treasure to everybody in Burlington. And, and people who are not even from Burlington. And, right and, and yeah, it's exactly, you come visit the town, it's, it's nice to have that there. So, um, Adrian, did you want to talk about what you've been seeing at the Neighborhood Planning Association around this? Yeah, um, definitely. So I'm, I'm just gonna talk quickly about City Hall Park because I think it's a, it's a very important issue in our community. It's one of the few green spaces that Burlington has and it's a place where people can sit down and relax and eat lunch and hang out outside and not um, feel the pressure of the rest of the city, even though you know, Burlington isn't huge. But <laughs> um, uh, so I have been attending a lot of meetings on regarding uh, City Hall Park, and I think that um, the city of Burlington has done a lot to invite um, public inquiry and comment on on this issue as. Um, I remember back in November in my neighborhood planning assembly for wards two and three, we had someone come and present, um, Megan Tuttle specifically from uh, the Department of Planning and Zoning on working on City Hall Park, inviting public comment for the month of, for a couple weeks in December and taking those comments and running with them and then incorporating the comments that she heard at that meeting into a new plan that was revealed on um, August 14th that was also an open public forum where people could come and discuss these new changes. Um, so at the last city council meeting that we had uh, this past Monday, the city councilors voted um, to continue with the development of the park in the design phase. Um, so they uh, decided that they were going to allocate about half a million dollars towards the contractors so they could continue work on design, but nothing is set in stone yet for the final plan of the park, although we do have a blueprint. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the blueprint, a couple of issues that I've noticed that are really contentious in the community are things such as, um, let's see, the kiosk is a really big issue. Um, you also have the water feature that a lot of people are up in arms about, um, which is something that um, I think people are used to having the fountain as the central component of City Hall Park. A lot of people are concerned about, well, if that fountain goes, what's, what's going to bring that centrality to, to the park? And um, are we going to have any other water sort of attraction to invite people into the park? Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. This kiosk, what is this kiosk? Explain to me the kiosk. What's the yeah, the <laughs> yeah. What's one controversy around the kiosk? Just a little background last night. Adrian offhand mentioned this in a rad meeting, and I was like, what? Um, yeah. so why I are want people you to, arguing about a kiosk? I want right, you to explain right, right. to me this kiosk <laughs> yeah. and why people are arguing about it. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, the issue is, is that a lot of community members feel like they don't want to have a commercial entity in the park to sell them um, goods and uh, that the park should be sort of a haven from the rest of the um, commercial aspect of Main Street and Church Street and things like that. Um, the idea would be that it'd be some sort of like coffee kiosk that would be open all year round. You can go get oh. a $5 coffee. Yeah, get a $5 coffee. Yeah, people can afford that. Um, <laughs> the, the concern, so there are a couple of concerns. The, the big one is, is that you know, people don't want to feel invaded when they're in a park by someone mm -hmm. asking them for, for um, money to buy something or whatever. And um, another big concern that people have is the trash. You know, if there's a kiosk that's in the middle of the park, people are going to have food and drinks and things, and those might get put around in certain places, mm -hmm. and it might require more maintenance. Um, on the positive side, there's this idea that it would be good to have uh, a private entity in the park in case um, there's any um, 
I don't know, misconduct taking place in the park or people are acting inappropriately so that someone could call the cops if there was a concern because there's a concern now that people congregate in the park for the wrong reasons. Um, which is true across th- every park Which in is true. I mean, yeah. this isn't, yeah. Um, so those are just some of the concerns that people have regarding uh, the kiosk and it's still being debated and discussed um, for the final, the final plan. Yep. Anything else that uh, people are really wound up about the park? Yeah, um, I think bathrooms are a really big issue in Burlington, especially public, um, ah. publicly available restroom facilities. Yeah. Um, right now, I think the plan does include a public restroom. The, the concern that the mayor's office and a lot of other um, mm-hmm. advocates have is, well, who's going to staff these bathrooms in case they get out of hand or they need a lot of attention and work? Um, right now, there's no access to public access to bathrooms on the weekends in Burlington because City Hall is closed, which invites a lot of public urination. And I know that that's something that we don't want in our city. Yeah, yeah. So, you don't have bathrooms, and what are people going to do? Yeah, what are people going <laughs> to do? So the the hope is is that with this new City Hall park design, we'll, we'll have a bathroom that's available to people on the weekends that will be kept clean and orderly, and it'll be a way for, you know, at least tourists will have some place to go if they need to go to the bathroom. I mean, Burlington gets about three million tourists a year, which has also led to the degradation of uh, City Hall Park in itself. Um, so that's a concern that we have, too, and I think that's why the park definitely needs an update. All right. Um, anything, uh, anything about Memorial Auditorium? Um, Memorial Auditorium, so September 26th, the Neighborhood Planning Assemblies are having a forum on uh, Memorial Auditorium. Uh, the organization um, Save Memorial is, is taking part as well, and um, it'll be an opportunity for different members of the community to come in and talk about their opinions on Memorial Auditorium and what they hope to see in the future, um, how they envision the space being used. Uh, Memorial Auditorium has gone through Um, a bunch of different phases, but it's essentially been cut out of a lot of the funding that the city has, which Which is an issue. Which is a shame. Um, The Memorial Auditorium, I am in the favor of building an exact same Memorial Auditorium just with 2017 commodities um, right where it is, because it is just, it's something as a statewide thing that people have been attracted to. And I, Burlington needs a civic center. Burlington needs some type of civic center. which the Memorial Auditorium played a great role too. Um, I remember back when I was a little kid, I'd go watch uh, WWE SmackDown at the Memorial Auditorium, oh, cool, yeah. um, and they just had a bunch of shows, and it was a great place. We and used to have uh, Champlain College used to play basketball there. Like it, they just need to rebuild it. And I'm really gonna if if I've you know a lot of patterns in Burlington have gone towards private development and a certain person in power strong arming the city into private development. Um, and T- Touted as the, the way forward. Touted as the way forward and the way to be better and in a really sleazy, non-Burlington-like way. Yeah. And it's gonna be a shame if a place like Memorial Auditorium gets thrown down that same line and yeah. we lose a thing like that in our community, which is you know, a statewide thing that people from all across the state would come and enjoy. So keep it public and accessible. And same thing with Burlington Telecom. Keep it pu- keep it public. Ah, Just, you know, two minutes left. Two Burlington minutes left. Telecom. Burlington you said Telecom. the magic words. Oh boy. So uh, Burlington has. Uh, we got one minute left, everybody. So we've got a. Uh, uh, basically a public utility in Burlington Telecom. It kind of got mismanaged and so people lost a little bit of trust in it. And when that happens, what does the, um, what does the private industry do? They say, oh, well. Can't I, do that. You can't manage it with, as a public option. You better let us handle it. We're the pros, right? So um, we've got three people bidding to purchase Burlington Telecom right now. Um, I am in the camp of keeping it as a co-op uh, where the people that pay for the service own the service. Um, I think it's a great thing that we should protect. Uh, there is a city council meeting this Monday, and we invite everybody to come and speak in support of uh, whatever type of city hall park you want to have, or uh, please come and speak in support of a co-op to keep managing Burlington Telecom. Is that our time? And everybody, thank you so much for joining us this month for Rights and Democracy Television. We hope you enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.